you really should not be using a slicer to make brims. They actually really suck at it. So in this video, we're gonna talk about how to actually do a brim correctly and how to not have to use a slicer so you don't have to rely on that piece of garbage just messing up your part. Now, when I say messing up the part, I do mean that. If you place a brim onto a part, what you end up with is a bottom edge that has either marred up from any sort of deburring that might have to be done, or potentially just a place of weird extrusion because you have the brim left over there. But the brims are very often necessary. If you're making a part with really sharp or thin tendril-like features, you kind of need a brim because those features can't just necessarily reliably stick to the print bed. So you need to give them a larger surface area so that they actually can stick to the bed. Everyone always flips on the little brim feature inside of the slicer and the brim pops out. But then you spend time, tons of time, cutting at it and polishing it and sanding it and cleaning it up and that kind of stuff. And in the context of things like our print on demand applications where you can upload a file and then have the product shipped to your customer on like your Etsy or your Shopify store, that can introduce the opportunity for problems because you introduce the chance for some sort of error to happen. And the more brim there is to be removed, the more opportunity there is for that. So you really actually want to optimize the brim, especially if you're gonna make a million of these things. When your product catches and you actually have to mass produce it, you do not want to be pecking at the brim for an hour for every part. It increases cost, it wastes your time. You want the brim to be optimized and there is no way to do that inside the slicer. Slicers are terrible at almost everything. Their job is to turn a 3D model into machine motion. Once you start using a slicer for CAD itself, where you're trying to make thick walls and give it a brim and have a raft and have it generate new features, you're now following into this generic profile that just is not very reliable and cannot catch all the situations that you're gonna design for. But you can catch all of those in CAD. So this is why we wanna talk about brims in detail. Now, if you're designing a brim inside of CAD, the first rule is make it 0.2 millimeters thick. This is a nice generic catch-all. You can make it up to 0.32, that's okay. It'll still appear inside the slicer, but 0.2 is also a good catch-all, and then you can know it's thin enough. You do not want to make it thicker. If you make it thicker, it's now more than one layer thick inside of the print profile. And if you upload it to a system like ours, then it would definitely be a couple layers thick if you made it like one millimeter through. Now that is no longer a brim to be removed. That is a feature that is a part of the apart and we're not going to touch it. So just make sure it's very thin. The very simplest brim that you can do is a single shape on the bottom of your part. So like in the case of this star, you can just make a circle underneath it. You can also make a square, but a circle is better because rounded features on the build plate are easier to print because they don't have peel up points. You're trying to eliminate corners as much as possible. So a circle is the best way of going. You take that, you extrude it up into the part, and now you have a brim. It's an oddly shaped brim, but a brim nonetheless. And here's the very unique feature of this. With traditional auto-generated brims, they basically create multiple perimeters of the part on the outside. And then they print to the part itself, which has rastering in the side-to-side -side bottom infill pattern. The problem with this bottom infill pattern and with this outline is that the outline format can sometimes create pull-up and all sorts of other sorts of issues. And then the rastering itself creates a point of separation and some weird looks. Basically, there's a mismatch between the bottom of the part to where it can't really all adhere because it does the outlines and then it does the infill. It's much better and you have much better adhesion if you have long continuous lines where there's not interruption in the pattern of the part. That way you don't have to worry about deviation or bed adhesion issues if you're dealing with complicated materials. So by modeling the brim, you create a single uniform bottom layer. So this whole circle that we just created is printed as one single pass that is trimmed off, which means that it prints very reliably and you don't have weird little tool motions that could potentially disrupt your first layer. This is a really big benefit of using designed brims rather than using auto-generated brims, even beyond all the other issues with it. But this is kind of a brute force way of doing it. Putting a big old cylinder underneath the part is a nice clean way of doing it. And if you're not really deep into modeling and don't have a lot of time to put in like a complex part, it's a good way of doing it because it doesn't create that many issues and trimming it off is not a big deal. With these brims, however, if you're running it through an automated system like one of ours for like Shopify or Etsy, just make sure that you like put the word remove or something on it so we know that it's not an intentional part of your part. And as we do more of these, we need to be able to differentiate. So if you can put 
a remove on there, that gives us the signal that that is a removable feature of the part. Now, there is a simpler way of doing it. If you have a nice symmetrical part, like in the case of this star, you have these really sharp features that need to be tied down, but it's really only the tips of the stars that need to be pulled off. And the rest of it on the internal is really in the way, and again, it's just adding labor to it. Removal of all that stuff is cumbersome, and it's just not helpful. So rather than doing just a big old circle that encompasses the whole thing, do an outer ring. And you can modify these and design them in different ways. But that outer ring, again, creates a nice uniform first layer. If you are printing at home, you can use something like a concentric pattern so that you have a nice outer ring that's reliably put down just like a normal brim. And then it's very quick and easy to remove. Those are the two simplest ways of creating a brim. But one subtle thing, a brim adds material to the first layer of your part, which means that area can potentially be wider. If you wanna make sure that a brim doesn't leave an artifact on your part, regardless of how good the post-processing is, what you can do is design the part correctly for 3D printing. In every video, we talk about applying a chamfer to the bottom of your part. This is even more important when you are using a brim. We have a 0.2 millimeter brim coming up into these parts. What we applied was also a 0.5 millimeter chamfer. What this does is it has the point of contact of the brim slightly in from the outside of the part. And that chamfer also serves as a guide area for the blade that is trimming off of that part. This makes sure that the brim doesn't add more material to the part. And if it does, it's not noticeable. It goes from a slightly chamfered edge to a square edge. So this is a good way of having a part held down with a brim and ensuring that the brim does not mess with the tolerances of your pieces. Applying that chamfer makes sure that the brim can be trimmed off, and if for some reason it's not perfectly trimmed off, it still creates a reliable part without overhangs or elephant footing coming out the side from that brim contacting it. It also has the dual benefit of that chamfer and that brim coming together, creating a stress concentration right in there, which means that now, the brim can be more easily peeled off because it has a very tight break point created inside of it. And you can play with this a little bit more if you want to go into super advanced brimming. You can make the brim actually thicker away from the part and then thin at the point of the part so that basically you can just pop it straight off. But that's beyond the scope of this video and is not always useful. But I'm going to throw it out there as a tidbit for you anyway. Comment down below if you want the follow up for that. Now. Sometimes you don't have a nice simple shape like a circular star. Sometimes you have something weird that's going off in all kinds of different directions and you have one little tendril sticking out the side. In this case, you wanna use kind of a subset of a brim called mouse ears. Mouse ears, we've done an entire video about the actual design of these. They are a very specific feature that can be used in all kinds of different ways. Now, very quickly, for the purposes of this video, a mouse ear is basically a circular tab holding down that edge out there where it's needed so that you have a lot of surface area tacking down that area of the part to the print bed. This eliminates the problems with warp a lot and is very useful. The problem with mouse ears is that they do have to be manually placed and if you have a really odd looking part, it can be a lot of work. But again, if you're making a million of these, you want to design them correctly. So those are the generic types of brims. There's big old shape underneath the part. There's kind of a refined shape where you start minimizing the contact area of the brim. And then there's individual mouse ears if you have just an odd part where there's particular localized areas that you need to hold down. We have talked about many of these features before. Like I said, we had a video about mouse ears. And of course, we've talked about rafts in our other Design 4 videos. Ultimately, a slicer is a really bad way of creating features. These features are kind of lazy add-ons to help compensate for an inferior process in the olden days. But if you are able to design for it, you should design as many of the ancillary features as you can so you know you get exactly what you're looking for. Because as systems scale up and people use print-on-demand tools like our API and those kind of things, having more control of the CAD ensures that you're not beholden to whatever our settings may be for support. That way you can optimize your design at home and know that whatever goes through the system will still be what it was that you designed. And you don't have to go through an iteration process of trying to adjust to the features of the slicer or whatever it happens to be. The slicer cuts the object, creates layers of that 3D model and does it with intolerance. It doesn't add features, it doesn't move anything around. It's just what it is. You can create something much more optimized, much more reliable, and something just better that has less labor and a better quality output than what those generic menu items are that pop up inside of these slicers. So hopefully that was helpful to you. We have a number of these other videos around, but I'll leave it right there. Have a great day, everybody.